This week on The Futurists, Ramez Nam. Lots of gnarly things have happened. Lots of horrible events have happened. Many horrible events await us. And yet somehow, despite that, overall, we've made the world and the well-being of the average human on planet Earth better and better over time. Welcome to The Futurists. I am your host, Brett King. Uh, we are coming to you from various places across the continental United States today. I'm the host, along with Rob Tersek, my co-host. Rob, welcome back. Thanks. And we have a really amazing guest on today, Ramez Nam. Um, before we get to that, um, actually, Rob, do you have a couple of news items that you can uh, shed some light on, some progress in the future? Sure. Sure. Today's today's news from the future is really news about fighting the future or resisting the future. And that's often a common theme. Uh, we make a little bit of progress and then there's some resistance points that are encountered. Uh, news broke in the last 10 days uh, about internal confusion at Meta. Uh, famously, about a year and a half ago, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook changed the name of his company, changed the direction of the company, decided to focus on the metaverse. At the time, it was criticized as a, uh, a poorly designed goal or poorly defined project. And apparently that's still the case internally. So there's a great deal of confusion. Reports are coming out from Facebook, now known as Meta, uh, that the employee workforce is de demoralized, disoriented, confused, and there's poor morale around the attempts to build the metaverse. But at least Zuckerberg's metaverse uh, characters now have legs. So it's not a legless metaverse. Although uh, there's the, some controversy about that too, right? And there always will be. Uh, the other news is uh, there's been some pushback against self-driving cars, a topic we've covered a couple of times on this show. And um, you know, there's always been some uh, cheerleading enthusiasm around the prospect of, of uh, self-driving cars. But that always seems to be a future that's just around the corner and never plainly in sight. We've been hearing about self-driving cars now for 20 years since those first tests uh, that were done for the Defense Department in the Nevada desert. More than $100 billion has been invested in robotic vehicles. And now uh, Anthony Levandrowski, uh, who is a uh, former Google employee, who then switched, uh, went over to Uber, where he was promptly sued uh, for stealing secrets. Yeah, um, he's one of the pioneers of, of robotic vehicles. And he recently came out in, um, in, in Bloomberg, and among other press outlets, uh, to declare this uh, a gigantic tech demo. And he said $100 billion and no discernible progress, uh, pointing out, for instance, that robotic vehicles still have trouble making a left turn. And so until they can master those basics of driving, we're not really any closer to that self-driving auto future. So a setback for that, that's probably not likely to deter development in that space, however. And finally, one more item that popped up uh, is um, police in Edmonton, Alberta, used a controversial tool. Uh, they had DNA from a suspect in a crime and they used DNA uh, phenotyping to generate an image of what the suspect of that crime might look like. And though they released this information with disclaimers saying that they weren't 100% sure and that the technology they were using is not entirely proven, it immediately generated tremendous pushback. Um, and then part, that's, that's largely due to the fact that the, the suspect uh, image that they generated was a black man. Um, and so immediately the police were accused of uh, wasting money on racist astrology for cops. That was a Twitter comment. That racist astrology for cops. I love it. And even professional geneticists decried the move because they said the technology is not ready and that you cannot actually derive uh, uh, physical characteristics like skin color uh, from a DNA sample. But nevertheless, the police proceeded. Kind of a weird blunder on their part, uh, kind of a self-goal. Anyway, three three stories that show us that the future doesn't always come in an even path. And sometimes there are unexpected uh, side Wrinkles. detours that occur. Yeah. Hey, welcome back to the show, Ramez. It's such a pleasure to see you after such a long time. Brett and Rob, it's a delight to be here. It's been way too long. So uh, let me just uh, give give a quick intro about uh, Ramez for those that uh, don't know him. It, it actually, uh, born in uh, Egypt, came to the US at the age of three, did a lot of work with Microsoft, um, working on early versions of Microsoft Outlook in an Explorer and so forth. He's an author. Um, uh, he has written in the sci-fi space. So, you know, we often have sci-fi uh, guys on here as well as futurists. Uh, Mez does both. He, he straddles both of those areas. Um, 
um, his uh, trilogy on Nexus, um, on the future of sort of brain-machine interface, um, then also the infinite resource, the power uh, power of ideas on a finite planet and more than human, embracing the promise of biological enhancement. That was his first uh, nonfiction book. He uh, also works with Singularity in the energy space, uh, Singularity U in the energy space, and has since uh, got into his new venture capital firm focused primarily on climate and clean energy. Mez, welcome to The Futurist. Brett, it's awesome to be here. And you too, Rob. Thanks, Mez. You're, you know, you're the futurist futurist. Uh, <laughs> one, of the things, one of the things we like to say on the show is, is the definition of a futurist isn't somebody who just talks about it, but there's somebody who actually does something about it. Um, and there can be many things, right? Part of it is persuading lots of people to see the future or to embrace the version of the future that you're promoting. But you take it several steps beyond that. We first met at Singularity University um, almost um, about 10 years ago. Like uh, that. Yeah. Really, one of the best things I've ever done was to go to that course, that week-long executive course. And you opened my eyes uh, at the time about the coming rise of electric power, of uh, renewable energy. Um, and at that time, it was actually in a kind of a dark spot. It was it had been uh, slow rolled, but you pointed out that there was an exponential growth curve. Can you catch us up on the state of things in the last 10 years? Because there's been tremendous progress in uh, renewable energy. Yeah, the big thing that's happened really is that renewables have plunged in price. Uh, solar, wind, energy storage for the grid, batteries, and electric vehicles in particular. You know, 10 years ago, uh, 11 years ago, I wrote my book, The Infinite Resource, and I wrote an article for Scientific American saying that by that, that solar was dropping in cost like compute, some a similar slope, not, not exactly as fast, that there was a Moore's Law of solar, now we call that Wright's Law, that by about 2015, solar in some parts of the world would be cost competitive with coal, and by about 2020, in sunny parts of the world, solar would be half the cost of coal. At the time, that looked ridiculous to most people in energy uh, and most environmentalists. Uh, and yet that's basically what's happened. In fact, I was a little bit too conservative. Uh, forecasts have, even my forecasts, which were wildly optimistic at the time, have been a little bit slower than what's actually occurred. So what's happening now is, you know, we spend trillions of dollars a year on energy all up, including transportation, heating, electricity, and so on. Uh, depending on how you look at it, it was actually $6 trillion. We are in the midst of what will be a multi-decade transition. This is not absolutely been overnight. It's not going to happen as fast as deploying cell phones or social networks. And nevertheless, now uh, almost all new electricity build out is solar and wind. That's more than 75% of global build out is renewables. Uh, energy storage is booming. It's like doubled every year. Electric vehicles, it, even through COVID, when we saw vehicle sales in general plunge, electric vehicles have risen to being now 12, 13% of all global vehicle sales, you know, that annual growth rate of 40, 50, 60%. So we're we're at this point where we're still in the, the early part of the S curve, if you will. But what's happening is that in electricity, renewables have now become cost competitive. In transport, electric vehicles have gotten good enough that they're very exciting. And they're on the verge of just being playing cheaper than fossil fuel powered vehicles. Uh, and then we'll do the same thing to uh, industrial processes that use a lot of energy we don't really think about to make steel and cement to manufacture cars or build buildings uh, and other sectors of energy that are born behind the scenes. Those will come in time. But this is, you know, to stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming on the planet, we've probably missed that, to be totally honest. And even to say below yeah. two degrees Celsius, we need to get to net zero emissions around the planet. It's completely decarbonizing the energy system by 2050, 2060, 2070. Uh, and I think that's doable, but it's still going to be a stretch and it's going to require continued innovation and continued policy work. Wow. Okay. That's a bold forecast. And that's an impressive progress. Uh, what are some of the biggest hurdles? What are the biggest impediments, uh, the hardest things to change? Yeah. Uh, I'd say there's a couple of impediments. One is there's sunk cost. So we have you know, new power, solar and wind are the bulk of it, and new vehicles, electric vehicles are still just 11%, 12%, something like that. Uh, they'll, they will be more than half by the end of this decade. 
But power plants are built to operate 30, 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. The average fleet turnover or the average age of a car on an American road is something like 13 years. So full fleet turnover is more like 26. Mm -hmm. And in other parts of the world, it's slower. So even once you reach the point where clean energy is all of the new energy you're deploying, you have this multi-decade tail of infrastructure you've already deployed. And either you've got to get clean energy just so cheap that you shut shut that down, that it's cheaper to buy an electric car than it's to drive your gasoline powered car, which is possible. Uh, or you have policy levers. That's one impediment. There's others. NIMBY is a huge impediment. Yeah. Permitting. Uh, people don't realize that to solve climate change, we have to build. We mm -hmm. can't just yeah. oppose everything. We have to actually allow solar farms or wind farms or transmission lines to go by someone somewhere. Uh, and then often non-market business models. Uh, a lot of utilities have monopoly business models where they don't actually have to do the cheapest thing for their customers because there is no competition and they get paid on a, a capital plus basis. So they don't necessarily see the actual economic pressure to switch to the cheapest thing because that might actually force them, the regulator might force them to lower the costs that they charge their customers. So that's a, a surprising one, uh, but it's a real one. You can see that in China too, where you know there's, there's heavy reliance on coal-fired plants to this day, yeah. even though they make solar panels and they could eat, they could begin to do that switch. Well, having said that, Rob, China's deployed more solar in the last three years than than the U.S. has historically throughout all history. So I, I think they are making that switch. But that, right, but, two different but things. Mayors, right. Two different things. Yeah, as but, existing plant as as remote. Sure, sure, sure. But, but Mez, uh, part of this is sort of grid design. You know, um, you know, we we have seen um, Texas, California, where I'm from in Australia, with South Australia, New South Wales, Victoria. We, we are starting to see traditional grids being challenged by climate change because of temperature extremes and so forth. Um, and this idea of centralized generation, the way we've thought about it, and and network distribution, um, this in itself really needs to be rethought, doesn't it, for 21st century grid design? So distributed design, um, you know, a grid level battery storage, incorporating, you know, you know, residential home battery units and EVs into the storage capability, you know, rooftop solar, all of these sorts of things. This is a fundamental rethink of the way the grid um, has resilience. So, um, you know, where would you, you know, who would you say economically um, it, it is sort of leading the charge in terms of this new design thinking around the way grids should evolve. Well, so I, I will partially agree with you. There is a huge new opportunity in distributed energy resources, in solar on buildings, in batteries behind the meter, in using electric vehicles as energy resources on the grid, just to charge smartly when we have the most wind or sun available, what do we power back on the grid? That is an enormous, enormous opportunity. At the same time, what all the modeling shows is that renewables are actually more dependent upon a larger scale grids than fossil fuel power plants because weather is less correlated over distance. So you look at Texas. Texas has actually, in some ways, a good grid um, market design. It's, a, it's actually a place where energy resources compete on price, unlike a lot of places in the world or in the US. But Texas is also an energy island. Texas, at most, can import 2% of its peak electricity demand from its neighboring states. So when you look at the Texas outages that happened recently, uh, A, the culprit was not wind. It wasn't a, a, even any one natural resource. And natural gas plants are what failed the most with these ice storms because you have every energy resource we build, whether it's a thermal power plant, like a gas plant or a coal plant, a nuclear power plant that depends on water for its cooling, uh, or wind farms or solar is actually somewhat dependent on weather. Uh, but B, when you had Texas struggling to provide enough power with the lights on, next door in Oklahoma, you had a surplus of dirt cheap power, right? Because weather events- But they couldn't access it, right? They couldn't access it because Texas has made the decision to be its own energy island, uh, ERCOT. There's three grids in America. There's the Western Interconnect, the Eastern Interconnect, and ERCOT, which is Texas. Uh, and even in the West and the East, we don't have as, as much transition between states as we should. So when we actually do simulations of weather and electricity demand, everything points to 
building continent-sized grids allows you to move power from the sunniest parts of the U.S. You can move power from New York to New York with less than 10% losses, pretty cheap. You can move uh, wind power from the Great Plains out to the coasts. Uh, that's what it would actually work the best. And what gets in the way of that is not economics. It's not technology. We've got the tech and it's cost effective. It is purely regulatory and it is mostly NIMBY. Yeah, the, so this is not in my backyard um, element uh, of, of this. Um, you know, how can we educate the general public that, um, you know, not, not only that, um, energy needs are changing as a result of, you know, the changes in climate and demands from things like cloud computing and electric vehicles. But what is the process to get people to understand the the significant longer term benefits of, you know, renewables um, just from an economic perspective? Because I think this is something we still struggle with in the United States and in Australia in particular, where people don't understand how much cheaper these energy sources are going to be in the future. I think we see it somewhat on a local basis. You know, most people that install solar on their rooftops do so because they want it, but also they, they see that they actually save money in their bill. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, it runs her own business where she had a, a gasoline powered pickup truck as her uh, main work vehicle and she switched to an electric vehicle and the monthly payments on the vehicle are less than what she saves in fuel costs mm. even after adding in her electric charging costs wow we have amazon ordered a hundred thousand electric trucks from rivian these delivery vans you know like the ups and fedex vans yeah, yeah. vans and they did it because employees were really Frustrated with Bezos, several thousand employees wrote him a letter on how Amazon had to do better in climate. Hundreds just didn't walk out, but they also did it because when they did the math, they actually said, "Oh my gosh, this will actually save us money. There's an investment in these electric vans will pay back in two or three years with because electricity and the high efficiency of these vehicles and the low maintenance costs, which are so simple, was will actually save us money even if we have to switch over the whole fleet." So we're starting to see that happen now. Uh, and that narrative is starting to get more into the mainstream, certainly in business, it is. And so I think that the, the Ford's decision to launch an electric version of the F-150 truck is so important because the customer for that truck has hitherto been resistant, right, to energy initiatives. Um, as you both have pointed out, it's a case, it's a matter of case by case, one person at a time has to have their own epiphany. Uh, and so the idea that an electric truck can be more powerful, faster, uh, less cost of ownership and operation, uh, that could be a really compelling use case on an individual basis. I'm excited to see that. Mez, let me just take a step back here. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you clearly have um, evolved in your career. You've you've now become one of the world's expert in 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 this field. But you started in you know the technology space, like you know mm -hmm. my, myself. So, what was that journey like from you being a deep technologist to becoming more interested in the future, and then you know getting into um, you know like becoming the lead for, for Singularity University on, on the energy side? Yeah, you know, I have a degree in computer science. That's my only formal uh, certification, really. Uh, but I was always just fascinated with the future. I grew up reading science fiction, reading uh, popular science nonfiction books, and I was always fascinated by what's next. And uh, when I, working in tech gave me the luxury that I felt that I could try something new Mostly because I felt that I get hired in tech again. And that's actually a luxury that a lot of people don't have. I feel like they can just go off and do something. So frankly, I just hit a point in my career where I needed a break and needed to do something different than what I had been doing. I left, founded a startup. The startup failed, as most do. Didn't know what to do next. I decided to write a book. Didn't know how hard it was to write a book. Didn't know how low the odds were of being published and reading it. So I just did it. And that was my first book, More Than Human. I went back to tech for another six, seven years at Microsoft. And along the way, I just got really interested. I had a very cliche environmental awakening on a beach in Mexico, fell in love with the water, wondered why there was litter, thought I should look into things I've been hearing about the environment and climate change. And when I started looking into it, I uh, decided that both extremes that I was hearing, one extreme being there is no problem, it's all a hoax, or it'll solve itself. And the other extreme being we're doomed. 
there's no way out. I thought both of those were were kind of BS, honestly. Like it was obvious that there yeah, are yeah. Very real problems. And also obvious that we have enormous innovative capabilities when we put our minds to them. Yeah. And it was just it, the luxury of today, and this is a decade ago, is that now you have access to all the world's data or a huge fraction of it. So I could just go read reports by the world's leading experts and scientists' papers, and I could call people up and and not let you know their book. And that, then I started giving talks to promote that book. <laughs> and uh, people kept inviting me back. And uh, once you've written a book, I then you're a, quote, expert. Yeah, so yeah. I, that's dangerous, and I got smarter along the way. Yeah, and one awesome. of the things about public speaking is it forces you to master the material. You become a great student when you're, stand, when you're forced to stand on stage. Um, no one wants to embarrass themselves. So one of the things that's interesting uh, is what I'm hearing you describe in your own epiphany, your own, your own course uh, of evolution, is that you're a storyteller. Um, and, and this is really kind of at the key of our show, uh, uh, The Futurists, um, because everyone we talk to is either a science fiction writer, which you are, or they're a scenario planner in some fashion, sometimes in a specific discipline and sometimes more broadly, they're futurists for hire uh, and they'll provide that as a service. But scenario planning, let's get real, it is storytelling, right? Because you're having to take some uh, some facts, you start with some facts, some trends, do some extrapolation and then posit a scenario in the future. And this is the point when the fiction starts because then at that point you have to sort of flesh that uh, story or that scenario out with some facts. And so what we're finding is that there's a little parallel between what a futurist does and what a science fiction author does. And you do both. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the importance of stories. Yeah, so I, I have never worked as a professional futurist. I've never been hired to do scenario planning or anything like that. I, instead, what I've done is talked about where I saw the future headed and the key decisions I thought we had to make as a civilization, um, either in fiction or in non. I will say, you know, both of them involve the importance of thinking about the motivation of the actors and what do people want? What are the different entities, whether it's people, businesses, governments, what do they want? So you don't factor that in. You have something very dry and something not realistic. Uh, and then I think also public speaking, you've got to have an emotional arc through the talk to carry people along. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I always think your ability to apply sci-fi into this as well as the uh, the practical elements is is really compelling from a storytelling perspective. But uh, hey, man, listen, we're going to have a quick break, but before that, we like to do this thing we call a quick fire round. Just some some uh, really uh, pithy questions that uh, get, get get a little back background for our listeners. So he, here we go. What was the first science fiction you remember being exposed to on TV or through books? Uh, I'm sure it wasn't the first, but the first book was L. Ron Hubbard's Battlefield Earth. Oh, very cool. Interesting. Um, not a really compelling movie, but a really interesting book. What yeah. technology do you think has most changed humanity? Uh, digital tech. I mean, communications tech, uh, really, but that combination of the internet, cell phones. Yeah, absolutely. Name a futurist or uh, entrepreneur, if you like, that has influenced you and why. Kevin Kelly, uh, his book, Out of Control, I read it, I think I was in high school. I'm proud to have Kevin as a friend these days. And it really, you know, that was the, a period where Chaos uh, by James Glick came out, Complexity came out, and Out of Control came out. And Out of Control really persuaded me that there was this bottoms-up model of both innovation and decentralized control that was really fascinating that I haven't thought about before. Yeah, really awesome. relevant again now with Web3. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What's the best prediction a futurist or sci-fi practitioner has ever made, do you think? Well, wow, <laughs> that's a really bold one. Uh, that tomorrow is likely to be better than yesterday. And I don't know who first made that, but I think, you know, the, the anti- Maybe Jules Verne, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, what science fiction story, this is the last one, what science fiction story is most representative of the future that you hope for? Oh, my goodness gracious. Um, I think it would have to be a, a slightly utopian one. Actually, I would say this. It's um, Ian M. Banks's Culture World. Yeah, yeah. They're, I'm, I'm with you on that. Yeah, there are novels that are about a utopian future. They're very dark, dark, dark novels that have it on the edge of this utopia. And that makes them fun to read for me. They're thrillers. But they are about a world where we've, some species has surpassed the, the planetary boundaries we have and have really built a world of abundance. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, that's great. Let's uh, take a quick break. You're listening to The Futurist with myself and Rob Tursek, our guest this week, Ram Nam. We'll be right back after these words from our sponsors. Provoke Media is proud to sponsor, produce, and support The Futurist podcast. Provoke.fm is a global podcast network and content creation company with the world's leading fintech podcast and radio show, Breaking Banks. And of course, it's spin-off podcasts, Breaking Banks Europe, Breaking Banks Asia Pacific, and the Fintech Five. But we also produce the official Finnovate podcast, Tech on Reg, Emerge Everywhere, the podcast of the Financial Health Network, and Next Gen Banker. For information about all our podcasts, go to provoke.fm or check out Breaking Banks, the world's number one fintech podcast and radio show. Welcome back to The Futurist. You're listening to myself, Rob Tursik, with my co-host, Brett King. And this week, we're talking to Ramez Nam. Ramez is a double futurist. He's the futurist futurist. Not only does he work in a field where he exercises significant influence on events that are going to unfold in the future, but he also writes about the future as a science fiction author. So he's written nonfiction books and science fiction books. And Mez, What's the intersection there between the visions that you put forth in the Nexus series and the work that you're actually doing? Is there an intersection? Do the two inform each other? It's really about thinking about what's going to happen to us. The future is the place that we're all going and looking for a, a way to navigate through the challenges that we have. And I think while Nexus, you know, some people classify it as dystopian fiction, some people classify it as utopian fiction. Uh, it's a book where a lot of bad things happen, but the world overall becomes a better place. And that's actually my view of the course of history. Lots of gnarly things have happened. Lots of horrible events have happened. Many horrible events await us. And yet somehow, despite that, overall, we've made the world and the well-being of the average human on planet Earth better and better over time. And I think that's what, what lies largely lies ahead of us. But it also doesn't happen completely passively. It happens yeah. uh, through market forces, through other things. You know, Steven Pinker, you can read, but it also happens to the, the actions of individuals who uh, yeah. take the stand. Yeah, people with a vision who are charismatic can actually really make a gigantic shift. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and we're seeing a little bit of that right now that uh, we talked about the sort of bad things happening. For instance, right now, this conflict in the Ukraine, um, it's unfortunate because it's distracting people from other things that frankly could be a bigger priority. It's going to consume a lot of resources on kind of a pointless exercise. It's forcing Europeans, Western Europeans, to revert to some coal-fired plants and stuff. So progress on energy, uh, you know, future energy is being suspended for this period of time. Uh, so unfortunately, the future comes in fits and starts. Uh, and there are, you know, political events, uh, geopolitical events that occur that can set it back some. Uh, so we live through that. But it's important to look past today's headlines, the negative headlines, the press stories about the conflicts and look toward that future, that progress that we're always making. That's well, one I, of the things I, I've always admired about your work, including yeah. the infinite resource, which is kind of the core principle there, is that we have one renewable resource, which is human ingenuity. Um, yeah. and it's actually not renewable, it's, it's an infinite resource to use the title of the book. Non-rivalrous. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. We can share the ideas and actually compound them and make them more useful. And I have a slightly different view on Ukraine. Um, I think Ukraine is, is horrible. No one should wish for war. There's, you know, hundreds of millions of people being affected one way or another, and millions affected very, very, very directly. Uh, I think through Putin's invasion of Ukraine, most likely, we don't know the outcome, but most likely is going to massively accelerate the energy transition. I agree. Um, that we see that in Europe already. There's temporary increases in coal burning and whatnot, but the, when you look at what Europe's actually setting in place, they're going to massively turn away from natural gas and yeah. deploy renewables and green hydrogen faster than ever. I think it has strengthened the alliance between the US and Europe. I think it's probably net been a positive for global democracy. I mean, the verdict's still out. There's still some scary times ahead. I think it's uh, strengthened Taiwan against China, and I think it's made the US and Europe uh, you sort of wake up and get a little bit more cognizant and take some measures to be a little bit less dependent upon China and other totalitarian states, maybe even Saudi Arabia, uh, for things that are critical. And I, while I'm a free tradist, I'm a globalist, uh, I think those are all actually pretty positive things. Mm -hmm. I would never wish for this war to happen. There's still yeah. scary things that could, could happen. 
But I think uh, the most likely outcomes I see are that the world gets better as a result of it. I want to I, I want to change tack a little bit here, Mez, talking about ne- the Nexus trilogy and uh, the work you did there. Because, you know, if, if you uh, if you wrote a story about the future of, um, you know, energy production in a science fiction setting, that would be sort of naturally aligned with your your career in many respects. But you did, um, you know, nano robots that that had, you know, sort of brain control interfaces and stuff like that, and you know, changing um, human behavior and so forth. But um, you know, your series was quite successful. It was nominated. You 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 tied for best novel for the Prometheus Awards. You were shortlisted for the Arthur C. Clarke Award um, and won the 2015 um, the third the third uh, in the trilogy apex won the 2015 philip k dick award phenomenal outcomes congratulations but um suddenly you were now thrust into this world um where you're going to these science fiction award dinners and so forth with some of your childhood uh you know heroes what was that like be suddenly becoming networked with um you know these amazing science fiction greats oh my god it's such a privilege i mean i grew up reading David Brin. I'm a huge fan. Uh, my friend Paolo Bacigalupi is with the lineup girl. I think it's just amazing. There's so many people, uh, you know, Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank, who wrote The Expanse, who we've seen the last on TV the last several years. Uh, so getting to suddenly uh, be peers and friends with these people is just, you're like a kid in a candy store, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, I I I, I can definitely uh, see that. In, in terms of um, the the elements of future scenario planning regarding things like grid design and the things we we talked about earlier, in in terms of developing stories for science fiction, um, how how do do you think you can help people to think like a futurist to get in that mindset of understanding the rate of change, how we can stimulate that, how we can absorb that into society? How yeah. would you help people to develop that mindset? Yeah, so I've never thought about writing. I've thought about it. I've never come up with a way that I could write a story about climate and energy primarily because the the solution doesn't happen over the course of, that I can fit into a story easy. It would be a multi-generational story, I think. Um what I find is this, you know, I, I give a lot of talks and uh, Rob, when you came to Singular University, my talk started with sort of the global challenges. And then I think there was sort of probably a, an appeal to what we needed to do collectively towards the end with technology optimism intermixed. Uh, maybe the year after that, I was asked to give a talk at a hedge fund conference. And I thought, oh my gosh, the people here might be climate deniers. I can't give them a talk that is about what they need to do to make the world a better place or address interesting. Climate. So instead I just flipped the talk entirely. And the talk was just about the economic trends in clean energy and how clean energy was going to become cheaper than fossil fuels, and it's going to become cheaper to build new clean energy than to operate existing fossil fuel infrastructure. And that all of their investments in fossil fuels were severely at risk. And I didn't mention climate change to the very last slide. And then their answer is, and there's this thing called climate change. Policy is going to get more ambitious over time, too. I can't tell you the exact pace. It's going to be two steps forward and step back. The policy is going to keep forward, going forward, too. And that was the narrative arc that actually worked for that audience. Mm-hmm. And that's been the narrative arc that I've, I've largely kept in mm-hmm. most talks about climate. Because what I find is the vast majority of people who are in the audience, I'm usually talking to C-level executive companies, people at private equity or sovereign wealth funds or banks or militaries, almost all of them believe that climate change is real and they have to do something about it, what they lack is a bottom line argument to take to their organization that they can use to drive the right investment or change. And one of the points of resistance there is that uh, there's a lot of disinformation. There's a lot of information that's being published probably with the support of fossil fuel industry uh, that, that causes people to have a doubt or to resist or maybe to not take it so seriously. Uh, you know, a moment ago, you mentioned that the Ukraine war has shaken Europe out of its complacency, uh, maybe given us a fresh awakening as to the needs of the, you know, the, the, the transatlantic alliance and, uh, and the need to shift to new kinds of energy. Um, but, but we tend toward complacency. Right? If we've got a system that's working, we're going to go focus on other problems. And some, some organizations are paid lavishly 
to to write lullabies, right? To tell us uh, uh, to, to tell us fairy tales that'll cause us to kind of sleep, fall back asleep, or or not take this matter so urgently. Uh, a, a few weeks ago, I'd sent you a report from the Manhattan Institute uh, that was um, raising the issue of all the other costs associated with manufacturing electric vehicles, how um, electric vehicles and uh, renewable energy have a, a cost associated with manufacturing that we don't often take into account. And while that report was interesting, it's actually really well-written report, it's very persuasive. What I noticed in reading it is, well, give, well, give me a comparison, give me an apples to apples comparison on the cost, the total cost of manufacturing and installation and deployment, and then operation and end of life cycle. And they artfully avoided that because I think when you do that analysis, fossil fuels don't look great uh, and, yeah. and, and they don't compare over time. And um, ICE engines, uh, you know, traditional um, internal combustion cars also don't look favorable to uh, electric vehicles. So in isolation, you can find you know reasons to resist or reasons to deny it. Um, but when you try to do an accurate uh, point by point comparison, which is harder to do than it sounds because that information is not always available. Uh, but talk to me a little bit about disinformation and what you run into when you're out there spreading this message of the cost benefit analysis. Yeah, we're gonna do a lot. And a lot of it actually is, is mostly, you can actually get people sort of just look at the facts about today. Uh, but there's a disbelief, there has been a disbelief that the economic trends of clean technology getting cheaper will persist. And some of the leading think tanks, I mean, the International Energy Agency is actually a, a prime culprit in this and not a yeah. fossil fuel organization. They just have sort of a status quo bias, right? A lot of forecasters do. But I I no longer spend a lot of my time engaging with disinfo because what mm -hmm. I found and what the data shows is that most people make up their mind on issues like this emotionally and based on tribe, then they go seek data to confirm what they believe. So there will always be a Bjorn Lomborg out there or a Michael Schellenberg out, out there. And it doesn't, there's, it, of spending my time on that is just not productive. Mm -hmm. What is more interesting is spending my time with a bank that is was lending to, to coal power plants and showing them these plants are gonna go out of business, they're going to go bust before they pay you back, and getting them to shift, you know, billions of dollars of investment elsewhere, which I've done, right? Because those entities that are just bottom line oriented and that are willing to take a sort of a cold hard look at things, I think are amenable to these sorts of of economic arguments. And now, now the the tide has turned, like not fast enough, but we spent, depending on how you look at it, in 2022, on clean energy deployment, just capex. We're going to spend between one and one point four trillion dollars, depending on whose definition you use. All fossil fuel capex will be about six hundred and fifty, maybe seven hundred billion dollars. We are now spending more. That's just solar, wind, batteries, and EVs, basically. We're now spending more on that than we're spending on oil and gas, as far as new capital investment per year, and that's never going to go back. Never. That, that the doubling time on clean energy investment is like every four years right now. So we would like things to go faster, mm -hmm. um, but the fossil fuel companies are fighting in rear guard action on this. I mean, I do think part of this is also, um, you know, as as we look at things like energy production, as we look at automation of society, um, you know, resource allocation, you know, with with sort of systems design, you know, th there needs to be sort of some greenfield thinking in terms of motivations here. You know, I mean, if you look back in the 70s and 80s, when we knew ju just um, the the quality of our air and fossil fuel, um, you know, burning what that was doing to you know in terms of pollution. Um, the seventies, there was a very big environmental awakening. But you know, we we were willing to absorb seven to ten million deaths a year from air quality, uh, you know, degradation from fossil fuels. But there seems to be sort of this broader awakening in in that um, you know if we're going to deploy these long term large systemic um, things that they they need to have a net, more net positive outcome on society as well. I think this is part of the sort of generational shift. Yeah, but um, what's interesting about what Mez just told us, which I think is really worth underscoring for our audience, is is really he said two things. One is most people have a hard time envisioning exponential change, right? We, right, we we've exactly. heard that again and again from people like Ray Kurzweil. So that's a pretty familiar trope. But when you're confronted with the facts of exponential change, 
It's extremely hard to envision that. And the proof of that is what Mez said in the beginning of this. Even his most sunny, optimistic forecasts in his first book turned out to be wildly below the actual trajectory yeah. that unfolded, right? So that happens quite often with exponential change. Most people can't envision it. And then the tendency is to get skeptical about it, right? Is the, tend- the, re- the natural reaction is to say, come on, that can't be right. That can't be true. But the second thing that Mez just said, which I think is really interesting and goes kind of builds on the point you're making, Brett, is... You got to pick your audience. Uh, What he doesn't do is waste time. As he doesn't waste time with the climate deniers anymore. He doesn't waste time trying to engage with them or persuade them or get into, you know, uh, scraps on on Twitter or other social media platforms. Instead, find a high value audience, uh, a high leverage audience, and devote your resources and time to persuading them. Because that's where you're really going to make a material difference. No, I think that I think that's important. Yeah. Um, uh, Mez, you know, we've only, we've got a few minutes left before we finish up here. So I, you know, I'd like to get a little bit, um, bigger in scope, you know, and, and I'd like you to put your sci-fi hat on here and, um, you know, um, throw yourself into the world of culture, the culture series, et cetera. But, you know, looking out 30 to 50 years, what do you think will be, um, the greatest changes that humanity will see? You know, what are you most optimistic about? Well, say first and foremost, I am an optimist. I think some things will get worse and there's some scary events in the future. There's going to be some events that horrify us. But I think 30 to 50 years from now, the median person on planet Earth will live a better life than they do today. Longer, better education, better health care, more freedom is my best guess. Um, I, I think a lot of what's going to change lives the most is still the digital technology. We still have not reached 100% saturation of, you know, Pocket devices with speech recognition, translation between every language, and access to all the world's knowledge, and a built-in educational assistant, uh, and so on. I think that's a huge one. I think the role of AI as cognitive prosthesis uh, is massive. I'm not too worried about AI as entities or uh, you know AI takeover, but I think uh, one way to to look at it, I was talking with. Uh, Sam Altman at OpenAI is that you know today we you have people writing term papers using GPT three and I think uh, down the road and you see this in a short story uh, I have coming out you'll have people who say uh, or they people use Dolly to make images you'll have people say design me a house uh, five bedroom Rambler uh, split level mid century modern uh, with sort of a Moroccan theme. And it'll do that. Or you'll have, beyond that, at some point, we'll have uh, physicists and chemists. Like, we already have a little bit of work of AI helping us with uh, drug design, helping us with materials design. We're always going to validate these things in the real world. But I think AI is going to improve our rate of innovation and intellectual production. And I think that's a huge, huge benefit for humanity. And in addition to that, we'll solve issues at the bottom of the ladder. I think the average person on planet Earth, we better fed have access to clean water, more basic medicine, more shelter, uh, and more abundant energy. That's great. Mez, it's so nice. What you just did there was nice so neatly to tie together two trends or two themes that we heard so much in our in this show. Uh, uh, we've heard so much in previous episodes about uh, dystopian futures. You know, the idea that science fiction, and particularly in science fiction movies, it's a lot easier to portray a dystopia than it is to portray a utopia. Utopias tend to be boring and they're not great drama. And so Hollywood doesn't focus on those as much. Um, you know, dystopia is scary and it motivates people and it creates conflict and drama. But we, what you just shared is a vision of, of constant incremental improvement. And it's probably worth putting that in the context of that's also been the story of the past 100 years and frankly, the past 1000 years although we don't tend to notice it because we tend to notice those big events, the big conflicts, the big setbacks, uh, the hardships and so on. You know, it just in the last 20 years, uh, um, about a billion people have been raised out of extreme poverty into a kind of middle class, you know, and and probably not the middle class that we're, we're aware of here in the United States, but that's a significant achievement, right? That's a huge achievement on the planet earth. It's happening in places that are far from the United States. So most Americans don't notice that um, and they tend to focus on what's near to them, which might not be the same story. Um, But I think it's really great to keep that vision of ever growing incremental progress forward. It's great to keep that vision in mind. Uh, But that's cool. As a science fiction author, you're not going for the easy points here. You're going for the toughest story of all, the, the hardest narrative to tell. 
Well, that's why in yeah. sci-fi we have to have terrible things happen. But you got to have the reader has to have a reason to turn the page. There's got to be tension. Yeah. Uh, so I don't I don't criticize sci-fi authors for writing dark stuff. But that's why Nexus is the way that it is as a trilogy. Is like there's constantly fear that horrible things are going to happen to the main characters or to the world, and bad things do happen to a lot of the protagonists. Uh, while overall, if you read the books, the world gets better. Yeah, I mean, listen, this is hardwired into humans. We want the story of redemption. We want the story of salvation. We want the story of resurrection. You're going to some really, really core like beliefs that are hardwired into human beings, I think, maybe on, a, on an unconscious level. Um, so yeah, the, that, that drama, that conflict makes it a good read. But ultimately, things are getting better. And that's a super positive yeah. way to wrap the show. I think that this has been a really fun yeah, it's, conversation. It's, it, it has been. Um, it, it's fun. It's great to finally get to talk to you again, Mesa. Hey, um, what are you working on now that you want to share with uh, with our audience that, that's interesting over the next couple of years? So I've been investing in climate energy startups for the last eight years. I'm launching my own uh, venture fund in climate tech. It's the best time ever, despite global recession and so on. This is a booming area. It's just going to keep getting hotter. And so you'll have to hear more from me about that uh, soon. I think there's going to be like, I mean, the spend on climate mitigation and, you know, re infrastructure resilience and adaptation, as you say, it's got to be trillions of dollars over the next, uh, um, you know, uh, decade or so. So huge opportunity. Indeed. Um, and uh, how can people find out more about what you're doing and follow your uh, your activity? Go to my website, remeznam.com, or follow me on Twitter, at Remez. Fantastic. Well, Mez, thanks for joining us again on The Futurists. And um, you know, please stay in touch. And uh, you know, if you have some really interesting initiatives that you're launching, let us know. We'll make sure we uh, weave it into our news and activity that we do on the show. Will do. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Rob. Really fun. Good to see you. Take care. All right, that's it for The Futurist this week. Um, if you like the show, uh, please feel free to leave us a review, uh, preferably a five-star review. We're getting some really phenomenal traction now. The Futurist is now in the uh, you know top 2% of uh, um, podcasts globally, so fantastic uh, traction. Um, and tell people about it. Share it on social media you know, um, uh, and so forth. Uh, that all helps. But uh, we'll, uh, we'll be back with you next week with another episode of The Futurist. Until then, we'll see you in the in future. The future. <laughs> well, that's it for The Futurists this week. If you like the show, we sure hope you did. Please subscribe and share it with the people in your community. And don't forget to leave us a five-star review that really helps other people find the show. And you can ping us anytime on Instagram and Twitter at, at Futurist Podcast for the folks that you'd like to see on the show or the questions that you'd like us to ask. Thanks for joining. And as always, we'll see you in the future.